So I'm going to give you the secret sauce, how you should go about investing in the antiques and collectibles trade if you really want to become a serious investor. Now, a lot of the things we're going to discuss in today's video were already discussed in previous videos. I'm just putting it all together for you in one nice little package so you have a video to reference on my channel if you ever need to come back to these core talking points. So these are eight of my top tips, steps, if you will, on how to go about investing in the antiques and collectibles trade. So we're going to dive right in. Step one, pick a multi-generational collecting category. Now, obviously, this is very important from the standpoint, if you are allocating resources, financial resources, to antiques and collectibles over the long term, you want to make sure that the collecting category you pick is alive and well 10, 20, 30, 40, or even 50 years down the line. So let me give you a great example. There are three collecting categories that I always use as examples to prove this point. Number one is, of course, coins. You guys know if you watch this channel, I have a six-figure, highly valuable, coveted, rare coin collection. The reason that I have that rare coin collection is because I can go back, in most cases, hundreds of years and study the trajectory and the value growth of each of those coins. Coins are a multi-generational collecting category. Another great example of a multi-generational collecting category is sports cards. Sports cards are going very strong right now. A lot of your vintage and antique sports cards, as we head into the year 2025, are breaking new auction records almost on a monthly basis. Multiple generations have collected and coveted sports cards. Now, maybe sports isn't your thing. I'm not a big sports buff, to be honest with you. I enjoy playing sports. I enjoy working out. But I don't like sitting at home watching sports on a weekend. It's just not my thing. So as a result... I don't invest all that much for my own benefit in sports memorabilia and sports trading cards. But I know a lot of people that do. I am a consultant in the antiques and collectibles trade. I have a lot of consulting clients that love allocating capital to this particular collecting category. Let me give you a third example. Comic books. Comic books can now be considered multi-generational collectibles. Now, this doesn't mean that they're all going to go to the moon. Right now, we're seeing a weakening in certain subsets of the vintage comic book marketplace, but that's mainly due to the high price points that were achieved during the COVID pandemic when the government was giving out free loans, free money to every living being. And that was one collecting category that got overheated, like a lot of pop culture collecting categories. So right now, there are signs of weakness in the market, but that just means that right now the market is changing as a result. Eventually, that market will bottom out and it will potentially change going forward. It doesn't mean that people are going to stop collecting comic books tomorrow. You still have 10, 15, 20 years for comic books to be a thing. So if you are thinking of investing in this market and you buy right, more on that later in this video, you could potentially make money down the line. I just wouldn't really want to see you build a high-profile comic book collection and then think that 50 years from now, you're going to be able to sell it for top dollar. Comic books have some risks when we look at this market over the long term that coins and sports cards do not. I just want to put that in your mind. I know comic book collectors out there, they're going to come into the comment section. They're going to attack me for that. I've been saying that for many, many years now. The comic book marketplace is going to eventually change and evolve 15, 20, 30 years down the line. But it still is a viable investment market for the time being. Number two, you need to use caution with modern mass-produced speculative collectibles over the long term. Ever since I've started this channel, and I've been on YouTube roughly five years now, I have talked about the dangers of speculative bubbles. 
whether if we go back in my DeLorean time machine to the 1980s, the junk wax era of sports cards, the modern era speculative comic book boom that occurred in the 1990s, or even more recently, the great video game bubble that crashed and burned. All speculative markets have risk. You need to understand that only three main markets govern the entire antiques and collectibles trade. Those three markets are speculative, established, and mature. If you are collecting collectible card games, video games, certain vintage toys, you need to understand that you're on the speculative end of the pop culture collectibles market. Now, that doesn't mean that those items can't go higher in the future. You just have to be aware that you are taking on a lot of risk if you are parking all your money in those collecting categories. You have to use caution in that regard. Number three, you have to understand that at the end of the day, antiques and collectibles provide no underlying cash flows. They are completely volatile and they are entirely speculative. It doesn't matter if you're putting your money in fine art, rare coins, historical artifacts, Pokemon cards, Beanie Babies, Funko Pops, comic books, vintage toys, whatever it is. You need to realize that all these markets are extremely speculative and volatile. Some markets are just better than others. Obviously, if you were going to come to me and tell me that you were going to invest in Pez dispensers, Pogs, and Beanie Babies for the next 10 to 20 years, I would tell you that's a bad idea. Now, if you're going to put your money in vintage comic books, sports cards, coins, even certain vintage Pokemon cards or vintage toys, I have no problem with that. Those markets will probably still be around 20, 30, 40, 50 years from now. They're going to be transformed because the only constant in the entire antiques and collectibles trade is change. These markets are always moving and evolving in one way or another. They're always expanding or contracting. That's why we have booms and busts in a lot of these markets if you track them over time. But make no mistake, they are all entirely speculative. Before you start investing in these markets, you have to look at the opportunity cost of how much money you are tying up in these type of speculative assets. Would your money be better sitting in a professionally managed financial asset portfolio? Would your money be better just sitting simply in an index fund over the long term, an S&P 500 index fund, a Vanguard total stock market index fund, take your pick. Or would it be better for you to pay down debt? Would it be better for you to buy a house? Would it be better for you to go to college, get a degree, better yourself? These are all things you have to take into account. Always remember, and I've been arguing this since day one, wealthy people, like myself, like others that choose to invest in antiques and collectibles. We diversify in these markets. We don't go all in. If you are one of these people that come to YouTube and you get your investing advice from some of these YouTubers that pump comic books or Pokemon cards or video games or Funko Pops, whatever it is, and you go all in diamond hands, I'm sorry. You're probably not the savvy investor you think you are. The people that really make money in these markets understand that patience and research is key to make money in these markets over the long term. Always remember, the antiques and collectibles trade is an alternate asset class. It's just like cryptocurrencies. It's just like precious metals. It's just like commodities. If you're putting all your money in alternate asset classes, there is a problem there because, again, these are called alternate asset classes for a reason. In most cases, these asset classes are not on par with traditional financial assets like stocks, bonds, mutual funds, ETFs, and or even real estate. Those should be the core of any investment portfolio. 
alternate asset classes. I don't care if it's antiques, collectibles, cryptocurrency, Bitcoin, gold, silver. Those type of asset classes should make up a very small portion of an overall well-diversified financial portfolio that will weather the storm through thick and thin over the short term and over the long term. In subsequent videos, I'm going to be doing on this channel at some point, if I ever get around to recording them, because they are involved and in depth, I am going to be showing you how much investing in some of these alternate asset classes is costing you, not only in opportunity cost, but also in volatility. You know, each time you choose to invest in an alternate asset class, again, doesn't matter if it's antiques, collectibles, cryptocurrency, gold, silver, you're taking on much more risk and you're adding more volatility to an already volatile portfolio of assets. This has to be taken into account. This is one of the reasons I get in so many heated arguments with a lot of the crypto bros that think everybody should hold massive amounts of cryptocurrency. Not understanding the risk, not even understanding if you go from just 5% percent of your total portfolio being devoted to cryptocurrency and you go up to 10 percent are you aware how much volatility you just add it to that overall financial portfolio if you're not aware of that if you don't even know how to figure that out i'm sorry you're not a savvy investor you're a timmy and that's why i do this channel to try to teach these basics to a lot of people that watch all these high profile content creators who call themselves social media influencers and all you guys and gals you want to be like these guys not understanding that a lot of the stuff they're putting out is nothing but toxic poison and if you do take their advice in most cases you're gonna be worse off than you are right now enough said on that number four you need to understand the differences in mindsets between a collector, a speculator, an investor, and a dealer. Now, shameless plug, shameless spoiler alert. I did a video on this about two years ago. It's a whiteboard video. You can go Google it, my channel, and you'll come up to that video. I think it has seven to 8,000 views at present time. It goes in depth on the differences in mindsets between a collector of antiques and collectibles versus that of a speculator versus that of an investor versus that of a dealer. And they all come from different perspectives. If you want to be an investor, that is much more different than being a short-term flipper, a speculator, or being a dealer, or being a collector. Collectors collect out of passion. Investors collect with the idea that at some point they're going to sell that item that they're collecting or investing in for a profit. There's a lot of different mindsets that people have who come into the antiques and collectibles trade. If you want to make money in these markets, you have to learn to adopt the correct mindset. And it's very hard for someone who is just geared towards being a collector because they have a passion towards these markets to then go from being that of an investor. Investors do not act out of emotion. Well, let me say that again. Successful investors do not act out of emotion. They act out of logic. They act out of reasoning. They look at the numbers. They look at the facts and they make an educated decision. Whether they have a strong emotional attachment to that decision one way or another. I've said this before, I get heavy criticism every time I state this, but I'm going to repeat it because I swear by it. No one gets emotionally attached to an S&P 500 index fund. I am sorry, I'm educated in finance. I know a lot of people that invest regularly over decades into an S&P 500 index fund or another type of stock index based mutual fund or ETF equivalent. None of them ever come to me and say, well, gosh darn it, I'm obsessed. I love my Vanguard S&P 500 index fund. All is what it is, is it's abstract numbers on a screen. 
it means nothing. It does not have the same meaningful relationship to somebody who collects vintage toys or comic books or Pokemon cards or even rare coins. People do not get attached to financial assets as easily as they do as physical alternate asset classes. This is why I get into a lot of debates with gold and silver bugs. Gold and silver bugs, they always invest in gold and silver and they take physical delivery of the product. They need to have it. They need to hold it. They need to touch it. They fall in love with it and they end up making disastrous investment decisions as a result. I see it day in, day out in the antiques and collectibles trade. You have to have the right mindset if you're going to invest in these markets, either over the short term or over the long term. And part of that comes with the understanding that you have to learn to let things go. Sometimes you have an item, you know you can easily replace it. Someone comes along and says, hey, I'm going to offer you three times the amount that you paid for that item. And you sometimes have to fight yourself and say, you know, I paid a thousand dollars for this item. This person's offering me three grand. I know I can get it again sometime in the future. Let's let it go. Some people cannot let go. There's a lot of hoarders. There's a lot of people that have some type of weird relationship with these items where they constantly consume, they constantly buy these items, but they never seem to want to let anything go. That is not the mindset of a long-term investor operating in these markets who wishes to make a profit. And this is something that I also rail against. If you guys watch the reality television show, American Pickers, you can see examples of people that are in that show that are secretly hoarders. They are not collectors. They are not investors. They're obsessed with these items. They live with these items and they just can't seem to let them go. That is the sign of a mental illness. That is not the sign of somebody who is logically putting together a financial portfolio of antiques and collectibles to invest in. Again, whether it be over the short term or over the long term. Number five, think globally. But just know the United States currently drives most of the antiques and collectibles trade. Now, that is slowly changing. There are markets, Hong Kong, China, United Kingdom, other parts of Europe that are slowly taking away market dominance from the United States. But just know you're sometimes better off diversifying into artifacts or antiques or collectibles that have worldwide appeal. I'll give you a prime example. I collect rare coins. Obviously, I'm partial to rare classic antique coins that were mended in the United States. But I also diversify into ancient coins. Why do I diversify into ancient coins? Well, it's unique. It's fascinating. Some of these coins go for a lot of money. And now you have NGC Ancients who grades these artifacts and encases them in plastic that takes away some of the risk of investing in these items. But more importantly, it's not just U.S. collectors that are going after ancient coins. When we talk about an ancient Greek or an ancient Roman coin, obviously these coins are not only popular to historians and collectors in the United States, but also around the world. So that's what I mean. As these markets change and evolve, you have to think globally more than domestically. So even if you're watching this video and maybe you live in Japan, maybe you live in the United Kingdom, maybe you live in another part of Europe or South Africa, you have to really think globally if you're going to put together a long-term financial portfolio geared towards antiques and collectibles from an investment standpoint. Number six, you need to engage in long-term market research. In most cases, the longer the time horizon, the better. Prime example, coins. When we talk about coins, especially U.S. coins, I have pieces in my collection from the late 1700s. So if I ever want to do a price history of that piece, if needed, 
I can go all the way back well over 100 years and just look at the price appreciation of that piece. Now, obviously, thanks to the rise of third-party coin grading in the 1980s, prices exponentially rose at that particular point. But I can still do price history on that piece if I need to, even before third-party grading existed. And this is what makes certain markets more fascinating than others. Sports cards. You guys that collect antique sports cards. In certain cases, when we talk about like the Honus Wagner card, the coveted card that everybody wants to get from cards from that era, you can go back, in some cases, more than 100 years. You guys as well have a long history of price research of wit you can pretty much make a valid, logical decision if you want to invest in that item. Other markets, when I talk about speculative markets, if we look at mass-produced modern era Pokemon cards, there really isn't that much of price history you can do for a set that just came out over the last six months or maybe the last two years and you're trying to make a logical decision, if you want to invest in that item, that relies more on speculation. Again, those type of items are more speculative. Now, to be fair, if you're a Pokemon collector and you're going after the coveted Watsy Wizards of the Coast first edition cards that were printed in the late 1990s, early 2000s, well, in that case, you got roughly 20 to 25 years of price history to look at those pieces and make an educated decision or guess if you do want to allocate capital to that market. But overall, just keep in mind, the longer the time horizon, the better when we talk about price research. Number seven, and this is a big one that a lot of people forget, research and analyze how many common, uncommon, and truly scarce items exist in the collecting category of your choosing. And this is where we're gonna talk a little bit about comic books. You know, I already brought this up at the beginning of the video. The comic book marketplace is going through a transformation at present time. Prices hit their peak during the COVID pandemic bubble when governments were giving out free money. Timmy's, Kimmy's, and Poindexter's were going nuts, bidding up a lot of Silver Age, Golden Age, Bronze Age, Copper Age books. Well, today, now that the dust has settled, we see that really it was the scarce in demand golden age books that are more likely to keep their value over the long term than the silver age, the bronze age, the copper age keys that really aren't that rare on the market today. Case in point, go look up what a copy of Tomb of Dracula 10, first appearance of Blade the Vampire Slayer, goes for Right now, in the recording of this video, November of 2024, in CGC 9.4, and look at what it was at the peak price during the COVID boom. You can do the same with Werewolf by Night 32, first appearance of Moon Knight. Those books have fallen in value a lot. So has a lot of your popular Bronze Age keys. Books like Giant Size X-Men 1, Amazing Spider-Man 121, Incredible Hawk 180, Incredible Hawk 181. The reason for this is those books were never really that scarce. I keep telling my audience this. You can have an in-demand comic book that is achieving a new high price point. A lot of people are going after that book. It does not mean it's rare. It just means it's in demand. As soon as that demand subsidizes, what do you think is going to happen to the price of that book? It's going to fall because it's readily available on the open market. Case in point, if you want a copy of Tomb of Dracula 10 right now, even in CGC 9.4 condition, there's several probably listed on eBay. I know, I think Dale Roberts, comic dealer, he has a couple on his site. I think Greg Reese may have a copy. That book is readily available. Same with Werewolf by Night 32. That doesn't mean they're horrible investments. It just means you got to understand that if you're investing in books like that over the long term, if demand pulls back, there's a readily available supply on the open market. As such, because of that supply is constant, prices are going to fall. This is why if you're investing in some of these items, 
you have to take note of the truly scarce items in question. And if you're investing, trade up and own those items because that's going to be the stuff everybody wants to own, regardless of the overall scope and strength of the market in question. So comic books right now are in a little bit of a lull. Believe it or not, golden age books, scarce in demand golden age books are still selling and they still get very good prices. Whereas those of you that went after giant size X-Men 1, Amazing Spider-Man 129, Tomb of Dracula 10, Werewolf by Night 32, what do you notice? Prices for those books have fallen. They have fallen a lot. They pulled back because there's too many out there. It's important to take note how many common, uncommon, and truly scarce items exist in the collecting category of your choosing. Number eight, last but not least, always remember that in the end, when it comes time to sell, the only value that counts is what someone is willing to pay for your item at the time of sale. The entire antiques and collectibles trade is based on the greater full theory. The idea that someone will be willing to pay more than you to own that exact same item at some point in time. If you're going to pay $3,000 for a comic book right now in November of 2024, and your goal is to keep it for 10 years until November of 2034, you better hope that that book that you paid $3,000 for, there's going to be somebody 10 years in the future that's willing to pay substantially more than your $3,000. And you also have to look at the opportunity cost of taking that same $3,000 and parking it in an S&P 500 index fund and just letting it sit there for 10 years and see what it does. This is what I mean when we talk about the mindset of a collector, a speculator, an investor, and a dealer. If you're going to invest in these items, you must understand business, economics, and finance. There is no if. It is a must. If you do not understand these core concepts, I'm sorry to say, investing in alternate asset classes, again, whether it's crypto, whether it's precious metals, whether it's antiques or collectibles, is not for you. Thank you for watching. Let me know your thoughts in the comment section below. And as always, if you do choose to watch my future content, I just may very well see you in an upcoming video.